Dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, Buna Ziwa, hello everybody. It's so nice to be here today, this afternoon with you. It is 1st of September, back to school. <laughs> And that's what we uh, decided to commemorate uh, an occasion that uh, um, summer is over. I know it was a very busy summer. It continues to be a very busy fall already. But we will use this opportunity to uh, stop, take a step back, and reflect a bit about uh, what the future uh, potential uh, brings for Romania. We. Uh, in the World Bank, uh, have recently completed and, and launched our um, eighth edition, in fact, of our uh, regular economic report. And we dedicated this report exactly to this issue of what is happening in, in the countries in the region in the context of multiple crises that are happening, um, uh, including the aftermath of the COVID crisis, the, the Ukraine war, uh, but most importantly, looking forward, what can we be doing to accelerate uh, development uh, in the region and in the countries, including in Romania? Uh, what potential will we have uh, with uh, business as usual ki case of scenario and what are things that can help us leapfrog going forward. We are very happy to have here um, our World Bank team uh, that authored uh, this report and our uh, country director, Galina Vincelet. Uh, uh, and we have a distinguished panel here today that will help us also hear about priorities of, uh, of the government, of, 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 uh, of, of the parliamentarians, as well as uh, academic institutions in, in Romania in terms of uh, the future development and growth. So we will have Mr. Ionuz Dimitru, Professor of Finance and Faculty of Finance Insurance, Banking and Stock Exchange uh, within the Bucharest University of Economic Studies, Ms. Anna, Anka Dragu, Senator in the Romanian Parliament, and Mr. Uh, Mihai Prekup, State Secretary of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, this event is uh, co-sponsored with the, um, the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. This is a tradition that we had in the past and we want to continue going forward. Um, before we will um, ask uh, the Galina to help us moderate the panel itself, we want to present to you some of the findings or key findings of this economic report. And I have a team of our senior economists, Katalin Pauna and Emilia Timish, who will give us a short presentation of those main findings to lead uh, the discussion uh, for the panel, to set the background for it. So without further ado, let me invite here Katalin and Emilia to, to make this brief presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, as uh, Anna said, my name is Emilia Timis, and I'm really just going to give you a flavor of the report together with, with my colleague, Kataline. Kat uh, this is a regular economic report, but we will focus today on, on Romania. Just to give you a quick insight, uh, as now is established practice, we do report in two parts. Uh, the first one really focuses on inclusive growth across the EU and, and across uh, all 27 member states. And here we look at, at uh, recent economic developments, especially at the household level. And then part two, which we really would like to focus on today, is about living up to the potential and really the uh, long-term growth uh, prospects. Um, so again, just to give you a flavor, uh, an inclusive growth, what we see that even though the EU member states really saw a swift recovery in 2021 after the pandemic, what we really saw, it was quite uneven and uneven across uh, workers and across firms. So on the left, for example, we highlight that although the employment really returned overall to pre-pandemic levels across the EU, we saw some of the vulnerable groups being left behind. Those less skilled, the youth, 
uh, those on temporary contracts really did not see the, the comeback as the higher uh, skill workers did. And similar patterns we see also at the firm level with the large firms coming uh, back in terms of sale faster and stronger, whilst the uh, medium and small enterprises still lagged behind. Uh, at the household level, um, we saw persisting effects of the pandemic. Uh, and on the left, we see that about 50% of Romanians after the pandemic in 2021 still saw increased difficulty in making ends meet. And when asked about the future, again, in Romania, we see that nearly 50% of those especially poorer ones don't expect things to get better. And that's before the uh, cost of living crisis. So the outlook for the people um, was not particularly rosy despite this um, recovery. Um, of course, we see a lot of risks and we can talk about it uh, in our discussion in terms of really rising uncertainty, the high inflation, the fiscal prospects, still disrupted value chains, and of course the energy security uh, concerns. But of course we can come back to that in, in our discussion. Um, now, um, the part two of the report and what's really our focus today is looking at the potential growth over the next decade. Um, we, here we focus on four countries, on Bulgaria, Croatia, Poland and Romania. And why are we looking at that? Because, well, now the world is, uh, and, and these countries in particular, are facing two destabilizing shocks, uh, the war and the pandemic. And quite recently, we saw, again, these economies seeing two destabilizing shocks in terms of global financial crisis and Euro debt crisis. And what we saw after the, those two crises is that the growth really disappointed. Um, and here you see for, for Romania, the growth nearly halved after those uh, two shocked as, as, as the weakened underlying growth drivers. So we really want to see whether uh, these are similar prospects going forward. And how to really avoid growth disappointing now that we're facing these two shocks. Why are we looking at growth? Well, we still see Romania, although it converged a lot with the EU in terms of living standards, still um, about quarter um, below the European uh, levels. Um, so we really want to see that convergence. And of course, for convergence, we want to see um, the growth catching up and, and, and being the strongest it can possibly be. Now with that, uh, together with our researchers and um, at the World Bank, we modeled um, the growth prospects over the next decade uh, for Romania. And what does it look like? Um, well, if current trajectories continue, uh, we see that, we estimate that the growth potential could be at about 3.7% a year. Um, how that uh, looks like, we still see the labor force uh, going down, so negatively affecting it, um, investment carrying the growth forward, and as well uh, productivity. So um, we see that as our baseline, um, that includes also the investments coming from the EU funds, but not uh, reforms. Now, that baseline, although seems quite strong, of course, faces the headwinds. The headwinds for investment from uncertainty, the reform slowdown, considering the uh, current environment. So um, that could really drag it down and, and again lead to the growth disappointment. So we really wanted to see what structural reforms that are within reach of the policymakers in the four countries could really help rekindle the growth prospects. So uh, together with our research team, we modeled uh, policy reform scenarios that could gro boost growth uh, and inclusion over the next uh, decade um, based on the national targets, European programs, and prevailing gaps. W what we really looked at is how can we counter the uh, labor force shrinking, uh, including through pension reforms and integration of migrants. And my colleague Katalin will, will speak a bit more about uh, the details for Romania. How can we enhance productivity, which is the key to growth uh, driver, through institutional reforms? Um, where we can really uh, boost uh, growth going forward. How can we uplift investment, both of absorbing uh, more of the funds available from the EU, but also 
uh, from the private side, how can we raise uh, research and development in the new technologies, and how can we really boost inclusion by um, increasing population's education catch-up. So these are the reform scenarios that we selected because we saw them as feasible and really as the main channels that could help um, growth in, in our four countries and particularly in Romania. So what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of numbers? We didn't only take some assumptions, we wanted to quantify. If those reforms are implemented, what does that mean in Romania on the ground? Well, if those reforms are implemented, again, those feasible reforms, um, it could really meaningfully boost Romania's growth potential over the next decades from 37 to 5.2%. And that's every year uh, by 1.5 percentage point, which is quite a substantial <laughs> number when you think about growth. Um, so if those reforms are implemented, what, if we close the education, some of the education gaps with the EU, if we improve institutions, if improve digital investment, and if we uh, look at how to increase economically active population, we can really meaningfully um, boost growth in Romania. Again, why does that matter? Is that then we could see Romanian living standards uh, really accelerating in, in, in terms of catch up with the EU on convergence and actually be on a better path than what we've seen from uh, before the pandemic. Um, what would it mean? Well, if, if those reforms are implemented, if growth is boosted, uh, the catch up uh, with EU incomes would not take 20 years like it is on current path, but it could be reduced to 14 years. So just to, to give you a flavor of, of what we were looking at, I, I will now pass it to Katalin uh, that will talk a bit more what those reforms would look like on the ground in Romania. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilia. Hello, everybody. I'm Katalin. I'm the economist of the World Bank. And uh, now I'm going to give you a flavor of the short term reform agenda of the government, focusing on a limited number of uh, the ones that we consider really important. And uh, as some economists say, um, uh, long run, it's a, it's a collection of short runs. So let's look a bit at the short run agenda and see what, uh, what we have uh, there uh, from the government. So I think uh, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, in particular, uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for this country to pursue uh, unf the unfinished reform agenda and to uh, promote invo uh, investment. There are lots of reforms and very coherent. It's a very coherent document, I think, and there are lots of reforms in there that needs to be addressed uh, over the next uh, few years. And I've listed uh, there a few of the more important ones, and we are going to talk more about uh, about the others. So. Clearly, I think that this is a probably a unique opportunity which have not had in many, many years, probably since uh, the pre-accession period when we had a clear calendar and a clear agenda for the accession. So this is a strong anchor and I think it would be a, a, a pity not to take advantage of this. Very importantly, the NRRP comes with significant resources, so it's not the only instrument uh, for you funding, there are also others. So I think that the resources are there to finance uh, these changes and to finance the eventual uh, the, the transition uh I want to I want to spend a few a few a few seconds about uh, on the fiscal consolidation, and this is because one cannot really have sustainable long-term growth uh, growth if we don't have a, a stable macroeconomic environment and a coherent mix of macro policies. I'm talking about fiscal, I'm talking about the incomes, I'm talking about uh, monetary policies. So, so here we still have a bit of a challenge. Uh, the deficit is very high still, so we are on a downside trajectory, but uh, we are not nowhere near where they should be or where we should be uh, if we look at the growth and the, and the stability pact. So we, pro we forecast for this year like a deficit in the neighborhood of 7%, which is still far away from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the 3% uh, uh, ceiling. Uh, uh, of course, we, there are excuses and uh, the pandemic and the war have put a lot of pressure on the, on the budget. Also the prices lately, prices of food, prices of energy. But not everything comes from there. So clearly, we do have a, a strong, uh, a strong uh, structural dimension of the deficit, and that was there since before the pandemic, and we should not forget it. And that has to be addressed to structural reforms, and those reforms should be on both sides of the budget. 
both on the on the revenue side as well as on the expenditure side. It is important also to stabilize debt. Debt is not high as a percentage of GDP uh, by European standards. I think it's the eighth lowest in the EU, but it's gone up very fast. And usually if you have a, a shock, an adverse shock, it goes up again very fast and then it's difficult, if not impossible, to bring it down. So you can see that the shock uh, from the trans from the from the covid put uh, put it up by by more than uh, than th 13 percentage points in only 2 years so you see this everywhere not only no, not only in in romania moving further looking at the at the at the at the, at the revenue side of the budget Clearly, we need to attract more revenue to the budget if we are to do better and more spending, public spending. And we all know that we have significant spending needs in education, in health, in pensions, and so on. To give you an example, only for pre-university education, Romania spends less uh, than its regional peers by two percentage points of GDP. So that's a significant amount. You cannot spend more and better in education if you don't collect more revenue to the budget and there you can see that uh, Romania has the law the second lowest uh, revenue collection in uh, in GDP in Europe there's a significant difference between the Romania and the Euro average and it is attributable to a number of factors some have to do with the tax policy per se maybe some taxes are too small probably you know, pro personal income tax at like 10% is the lowest in the EU right together with Bulgaria but a lot of this have to do with various exemptions uh, and uh, that we, uh, we we still have in our legislation and which leads significant to significant uh, uh, revenue losses and even more probably has to do with the administrative reform or uh, reform of the of the tax agency and I'm going to illustrate uh, this with some graph that Jonut and I think we prepared together uh, uh, looking at VAT for example say dim some dimensions of, of VAT so for example if you compare Romania with Bulgaria so Bulgaria in 2019 uh, collecting 9.2 percent of GDP in VAT Romania 6.2 if we look at the VAT rates Bulgaria has a 20% overall VAT rate and some uh, reduced rate of 9% applicable to a limited number of, uh, of uh, commodities and services. Romania has a 19% standard rate which is not that different uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than Bulgaria but still has uh, a large number of reduced rates uh, at 5% and, uh, and 9% which lower the effective uh, VAT rate. So, if we were theoretically to increase our VAT from 19 to 20 and bring the reduced rates applicable to 9% and applicable uh, to all the same, let's say the same uh, commodities like in uh, Bulgaria, then we should collect logically probably 9.3% of GDP in VAT, which is a uh, three percentage point more. This is not going to happen. It's not going to happen because we really need to go through what. Uh, what Bulgaria did, and they did restructure their uh, tax agency uh, maybe 10 years ago. And if you look at the productivity rates of tax collection in Bulgaria and Romania, there are significant differences. So most of this probably catching up will come from the modernization of the tax agency. The positive side there is that there is a very comprehensive reform agenda in the NRRP put forward by, by the ANAF, by the tax agency. So congratulations to them. Uh, but it's going to be very difficult to implement it. So I'm looking at Mihai and his colleagues in the Ministry of Finance to oversee that reform agenda. And hopefully in five years time, we should report some effective rates and gaps uh, comparable to those of the of our uh, other uh, members uh, in the in the neighborhood. So still significant differences, for example, in, in VAT gap. You can see all these countries have adjusted significantly the VAT gap. So we are far away from uh, uh, from even the, the poorest performers in the pack uh, over there. Let's move to another one. This is a public sector wage bill, which is a significant reform again in the NRRP. And this is needed because we have seen a significant increase in the, in the public sector wage bill in GDP. So this is the dynamics here, there. So for example, we had a minimum of in 2014, 2015, which is below the EU average and sometimes below the, significantly by, by, below the EU average. But now we have gone 
above the EU average in the conditions that we have a lower number of civil servants uh, than uh, uh, the average in the European Union. So most of this increase was actually in wages, not in employment. There was some increase in employment, but mostly in wages and mostly in in the variable part of, uh, of those wages. So all sorts of increases in bonuses fragmented and so on. Lots of this at some national, at some national level. And um, so this is what it is relative to the GDP, the shares in GDP, but it is dramatic if you look at the share in uh, in government revenue. So you can see that it's significantly above the European average, and I think it's probably the highest in the EU relative. Uh, so we don't collect as much as we collect, and we spend a lot on uh, recurrent spending. So that leaves very little to spend on investment, to spend on uh, on other 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 sectors which uh, which need more resources probably. Again, the good part here is, is, is that there is a coherent proposal in the NRRP. And the focus of reform is on ensure equal pay for equal work. Now you see significant differences between ministries in the level of salaries uh, uh, for similarly qualified uh, people. We also, I think it's important to incentivize performance, so to link the remuneration to individual and collective performance. It is important also to promote transparent and non-discriminatory wage setting mechanism. So it's important to have rules for setting up wages, for promoting, for increasing, and, and so on. And then importantly to ensure the sustainability of the wage bill in the, in the long run. Moving further, another important reform in the, in the, in the NRP, it's about the pension system. So overall, if you see here, Spending on pensions as in GDP, it's not high by European standards. Moreover, we have a very low ratio between the contributors and the beneficiaries. I think it's 1.1 contributor to one beneficiary, which I think is the most, uh, is the worst in the European Union. So these things are difficult to correct in the short run because labor market trends take very, very long term. So we've been stuck with this ratio of 1.1 to 1 probably for two decades. And we don't see it moving convincingly. This also shows that we have a lot of pensioners with low pensions here. So clearly one needs to do something about that. Moreover, this doesn't include the special pensions and the, the pensions which are regulated by, by, by special uh, legislation. And there is a lot of talk now in the public domain about uh, what to do about that. At the same time, the, the pension fund runs a, a deficit which is about 2% uh, of GDP. So that means that resources are taken away from the state budget and actually to cover the gap of the pension system. So we were, I showed you earlier that uh, Revenue collection in uh, in GDP is low, so moreover we take additional resources from there away from education, from health, to cover the deficit of the of the pension fund. Again, there is a there is a coherent reform agenda which is in the IRP here. It's about um, trying to address some of these uh, constraints of the current pension system: sustainability, equitability, and uh, and making it rules based. So one option would be to introduce an indexation rule which is linked to the economic conditions and remove as much as possible this ad hocness in the adjustment of the uh, of the increases in pensions that we hear almost every day on TV uh, coming from various politicians, right? So ensure that identical cohorts receive similar pensions. What we have now, Sim identical people retiring at various points in time receive different pensions. So there should be some correction mechanism over the medium term, which is of course consistent with the, with the sustainability of the fiscal sustainability. And finally, promote some transparent based rules adjustment mechanism. Uh, so we have plenty of examples in Europe. So where function of various indicators like inflation, the dynamics of real wages and so on, you come up with some automatic uh, adjustments in pensions uh, uh, which are not influenced by political decisions beyond a certain point. I think this is, the, this is what I want to say. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you both Emilia and uh, Kathleen, if this is on. Um, I think this uh, frames really nicely uh, the discussion that I hope we can have. 
And uh, without much uh, commentary, at least from my end, you heard enough from the World Bank. I actually want to turn to our guests. Uh, and here it is what I, I would be looking for is your reactions, not only from what you heard from us, but also sharing some of the insights that you as long analysts, observers, um, commentators of the uh, policy makers uh, in Romania may have. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to start with uh, Professor Dimitru and um, perhaps um, think through um, and share with us uh, how do you see the key macroeconomic challenges? Uh, Catalina and Emilia showed us a picture, especially on the fiscal side, where the fiscal deficit is nearing 7% of GDP. Uh, this calendar year, public debt is climbing up. Where are the priorities in your uh, views? Uh, on our end, we shared some of the structural factors driving all of these dynamics, being public wages or pensions. But how do you see it? How, how, uh, what is your assessment of that? Okay, thank you for, for inviting me. So uh, I was asked by Catalin to, to speak about the main macro challenges Romania is facing currently. I will just uh, name the, the main challenges. One is the budget deficit, of course, uh, and uh, the second one, the, the current account deficit, which, by the way, overpassed already 9% of GDP in the first part of the year. I think that should be a big concern for our authorities. And uh, not in the last, uh, inflation, which is 15%, uh, but uh, not to fool ourselves, actually inflation is much higher. So we have a cap for the energy price, and without that cap, inflation would have been 22 plus, I would say. And uh, secondly, uh, the producer price index is 48%. That should be the reality, I would say, of inflation in Romania. Probably we, Romania has the highest inflation in Europe, and I think uh, that that's the reality. I will uh, speak about the, the deficit, the budget deficit. Uh, Catalin referred to the, the spending side. Of course, on the spending side, there are a lot of things to be done. Efficiency of spending is a big issue, and we should address that as well. Uh, I will uh, just refer in my intervention on the uh, in my intervention uh, uh, about the, the revenue side of the budget. And uh, I think uh, the sequence should be the following one. We should start with the, the revenue collection. We have a big issue in that respect. Uh, we have a 33-34% uh, VAT gap, which is the highest in Europe. Yeah, The solution is to, to digitalize the fiscal authority. We are speaking about that for years. I remember that back in 2010, when I was appointed in the Fiscal Council, we started to speak about that. We are still speaking, but not doing too much. Uh, so uh, things are moving in the right direction, but too slowly, I would say. Uh, secondly, we should address the, the fiscal loopholes in the legislation. And we have a lot of preferential tax uh, systems for different social categories, and that should be key, uh, closed, I would say. So we are speaking about PFAs, microenterprises, uh, uh, property rights, uh, whatever. So we, are, we have a lot of loopholes in the legislation. The government just uh, addressed uh, partially the issue. We should close all the loopholes, not just some loopholes. We should close everything. And uh, not in the last, I think we should revisit the fiscal code a bit. Uh, Dividend tax is too low, property taxes are too low in European standards. Uh, maybe income tax is a bit low, but income tax should be treated uh, together with the social security contributions, which are quite high. Uh, and uh, we have uh, quite a high tax wage for labor uh, when it comes about uh, minimum wage. Uh, for the average wage, we are close to the European average. So it's completely wrong to say that Romania has a low taxation of labor. It's not true. Uh, and uh, I think we should address the social security contributions. Why uh, 
we have such a large or such a high social security contribution taxation, basically there are only few contributors and uh, a lot of people are exempted. For instance, we have uh, quite big industries with, which are completely exempted. Look at the construction sector, look at uh, more recently agriculture, uh, look at uh, IT sector, which is exempted from uh, income tax, but the construction sector, which is exempted, exempted from uh, healthcare sector contribution. And we are speaking about more than 400,000 people which are not paying healthcare sector contributions, but at the same time, they are covered by, by the poor uh, coverage we have in the, the public sector, in the healthcare sector. But uh, somebody should uh, pay taxes for them. So basically, uh, yeah. So let's start with the tax collection, then close the loopholes and uh, not in the last uh, revisit a bit the fiscal code and uh, increase a bit the taxes which are extremely low in European standards. I will stop here and let uh, Anka to continue if she wants. Very good. I do want to uh, to, to to turn to uh, to to, uh, to Anka to Senator Drago, of course, um, but maybe here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> let's unpack the the fiscal side, the fiscal reforms that uh, that we are talking about, and with the view of we see quite a lot of ambitious promising reforms in the NRRP and the National Resilience and Recovery Plan. How do you see the challenges to meeting those? Because the dividends from these reforms are quite high, it's quite promising, but if it were easy it would have been done. So where where do you see some of those, uh, those challenges uh, laying ahead of Romania? Senator? <coughs> Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, very much for the invitation and for organizing this uh, uh, debate here. I'm absolutely honored that I'm still considered a professional and <laughs> <laughs> did not say politician Dragos. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, there are a few people uh, in the room and here in the panel that we know each other for a lifetime, or very many, many years. and. We work together on the points already made here. Uh, just to, uh, a general point I'd like to uh, make on the current account deficit. And yes, I, I, I wrote uh, while uh, listening to um, uh, Catalin that uh, this is a significant imbalance, macroeconomic imbalance, external imbalance. And uh, um, yeah, uh, how we address it is not an easy way to address. And I remember, if you remember, um, you're not back in 2016 we had this discussion uh, the the current account deficit that was minister of finance he was the head of uh, fiscal, fiscal council. council and we were arguing uh, yeah he he was telling me he was not happy that uh, the current account deficit was uh, doubling from 1 to 2% of gdp <laughs> and uh, i was explaining how what can i do as finance minister in order to um, deal with this uh, situation what actually what you have to to be more competitive and to really uh, increase the supply side. Supply side always was little and investments in real economy, what you also put it on, the, on, uh, on your conclusions, uh, uh, have been always uh, lesser than uh, we needed. And uh, in the same idea, I, I think uh, one should also talk about uh, revenues increasing the revenues and increasing the economy overall because the Romanian economy if we look at the GDP GDP uh, is uh, half is, is uh, actually one third compared to po uh, Polish GDP although in terms of uh, other coordinates we are uh, half only so something we should do better investments uh, competitiveness, um, um, uh, the strategy for com uh, for competitiveness is somehow lacking and targeting investments towards uh, especially new technologies, new areas. This is the area where we should be more focused in order to increase the economy because we, uh, as we are macroeconomy somehow and uh, very familiar with the fiscal side, we jump into the fiscal sector finance, but it's not enough. Uh, we tied the belt, but how long? Let's um, make the economy uh, somehow bigger. Let's look at the financing. Uh, the financing of the economy is only, you know, the, the um, 
credit loan to private sector to non-government uh, is um, one of the lowest in the EU. It's 27% of GDP, yeah. while uh, um, the average is around 90%. So it means that the Romanian economy doesn't uh, have important uh, sources of financing. We know why, but the idea is let's do something to Im improve this. Without money, Romanian companies cannot uh, cannot grow. Uh, one uh, important step uh, was uh, somehow made, and it's uh, the National Promotional Bank uh, to help investments actually. And it was uh, passed. Uh, it was a, uh, I think, a draft law. It was passed uh, in the in the Parliament. Yes, uh, it was also. I'm member of, of the Budget Committee also, and. Um, but uh, if I have to make a comment there, I, I submitted four amendments to the law. Two were considered, two were rejected. And those two rejected were actually one requiring annual report by the National Promotional Bank. And the, the majority of the parliament decided that is not need of annual report. And it's written in other laws, actually. We don't have to put in that law, which is OK. And uh, then uh, it was uh, I made um, uh, something even more important to have uh, the selection of uh, the board of this uh, new bank that is important for the financing uh, architecture, financial architecture, to be uh, selected by uh, a specialized company. And this was totally rejected. So then I even told the finance minister when he came to the Senate, I said, don't be upset, Mr. Minister, and don't be surprised when the party will, uh, will take you a note with some names on who is about to sit in the board, because this is going to happen. So, um, and you ask me what what's uh, difficult, what I see to be difficult. Implementation, yeah? Implementation. Uh, there are um, two important reforms in uh, the Panerere, and I totally agree with uh, Katalin that it should be the anchor for policies. Uh, but what we saw in the uh, public debate is that uh, politicians are accusing each other that uh, it's a crap, and uh, which is not which is not true and is not efficient. We should really uh, have a sort of a understanding and let's move on implementing this project and let's consider it a prerequisite of your adoption because we have also to target your adoption. Look at Croatia. And Croatia was an economy that uh, was in recession since uh, 2009 to 2016 and now it's in uh, it, it, it's about to enter um, to adopt uh, euro yeah so but in the in the penerere um, uh, there are um, some important um, reforms regarding the um, logic of the uh, budgetary um, framework and this is uh, I'm, I'm talking about implementing the public uh, spending review which was started um, so it's not so difficult, uh, would, would not be difficult, but why it's difficult? Because Ministry of Finance and Minister of Finance should uh, have access to all ministries and ministers and write some reports that, saying that you Minister of Transport, you Minister of Agriculture, Education, what health, you don't do this correctly, you should improve here and there. I did it and it was very difficult in a technocrat government where basically the discussion should have been easier. Yeah. So this is the difficulty of implementing the public spending review. This review, so we, we take some conclusions, what should be improved in the, uh, in the public finance, should uh, be included in the budgetary process. Yeah, to be included in the project, uh, on the draft budget and so on. Uh, so I think bottom line, political will, it's very, very important. We really have to want all of us that Romania is moving forward. If we don't have this in mind, irrespective of uh, uh, the institution of the party, of its uh, government, its uh, agency, its the parliament, then we cannot implement the reforms that are so much important. 
and we cannot move, shift up the economy. We cannot get to this convergence of uh, real revenues. What we want at the end of the day, we want a better standard of living, yes, for for Romania and sustainable. But how we uh, we how we get there? This is uh, it may be uh, uh, I don't know a bumpy road. That's a really nice segue, maybe to turn to the state secretary and hear a little bit, uh, a little bit about how you see the priorities uh, of the Ministry of Finance, uh, the priorities on the fiscal policy, of course, as primary responsibility that lays there. But also, if I can, a little bit probe on the National Development Bank and how do you see that uh, that process uh, uh, start uh, progressing? State Secretary, over to you. Thank you, Galina. There are many things open here in this discussion. I think it will be very difficult to me to, for me to address all the points, but I will, let's say, uh, discuss on some big lines that were mentioned in this uh, report, which I find honestly very, uh, very insightful and uh, very useful, even uh, for, for a government. I think should be should be a document which should be presented to the more officially to the to the government. Uh, what I learned here was structural reforms, investments. Uh, I think this year we made important steps in terms of investments. Uh, you have a couple of points. You mentioned very well the NRRPP, which is 13% of the GDP. You have uh, uh, the budget, which allocates a, uh, an amount, which is, I would say, the biggest amount for investments in the last 30 years. Uh, above 80 billion um, uh, lei, Romanian currency. You have this uh, support plan for Romania, which is 17, more than 17 billion lei, most of it uh, allocated to the investment. But what I can tell you for, as someone coming from the uh, private sector is that the main challenge is, as was already mentioned, uh, is implementation. But it's not, I won't go so much theoretically about implementation. It's also about capacity of the central administration to recruit people with experience in investments. It's a very challenging. The salaries, because you had, uh, you had uh, a graph on the salaries. If you compare the salaries which are paid people working in investments here in Bucharest with people working in investments or investment sector related in the central administration, you will see that there is there is a gap on this. Um, for sure, reforms should be done in this perspective because we have to be competitive in order to be able to recruit talents also in uh, in central government in order to promote those investments. If not, you will always have these discussions about uh, what should be implemented, how should be implemented, what measures we should do. And most of them that you mentioned, I think <laughs> they are in the public sector for years now. Um, you mentioned the development bank. I'm very happy to, to announce that in the last 10 years since we are discussing about the, uh, the National Promotional Bank, the Romanian Development Bank, as you want to call it, is the first time this year when we have a law in Parliament. Of course, I think that you might improve points in, uh, in that law. Things can be improved, but we have a law which set up the general framework uh, in uh, in uh, registering a national development bank in Romania. And you will have very shortly, I think it's a matter of weeks, when uh, the, the government will approve the formal setup of the National Promotional Bank and we'll have it at the trade registry, hopefully uh, very soon. I really believe that by the end of the year. There are important steps which have to be made in this direction. I really like Galina also in the help of uh, uh, of World Bank in this uh, exercise with the National Promotional Bank. We are working on the specific strategy, on the specific products which have to be uh, addressed by the bank. And I think the devil, as he said, it's in the detail. And I think this is the main challenge for, for us to identify the specific projects, the products which are uh, relevant for the Romanian economy because the National Development Bank it should not do the job of a commercial bank, should be complementary 
for this reason, we have together with you to identify market failures. We have already some assessments in this direction. We have to review those assessments and to prepare specific projects, which uh, products which address those market failures. Another point, I really believe that the National Promotional Bank will be a promoter in uh, attracting additional EU funds. And also an anchor of stability, if you want, in Romania, because we know all of us, the governments and the position, the public positions are so volatile in Romania. And sometimes you need an anchor of promoting investments and a long term discussion partner for strategic investments. And also, of course, human capital, because this development bank is not about money more. It's about people, if you ask me and agree. agree. I also uh, send the same message to the minister of minister of finance. It's about people, not about money. If you have good people and competent people with relevant experience in this uh, national promotional bank, then results will start to come. And we'll see big inf infrastructure projects will be, which will be unblocked. I think the IFIs, particularly the, uh, the World Bank, IFC, will be more than happy to see a big infrastructure project unblock and uh, where you could crowd in some funds and some technical Six technical assistance. Uh, in conclusion, I mean, there are many things to be said, but in terms of investments, again, there are a lot of liquidities, not only in the market, but also EU funds, uh, funds from the government, funds, uh, funds, funds from the NR, NRP, NRP, <laughs> NRP, NRP. Yes. <laughs> as, you, as you call it. The, the, the main challenge is. Um, it's uh, having right people to to unblock these projects. Uh, together with our team, we are working now very, very careful, and probably you are aware of that on uh, setting up the first uh, PPP project, public-private partnership uh, uh, project. So we are working very careful on that because I believe I really believe that involving the private sector in preparing the project and and then investing some some money on it so having skill on the game as you say uh, skin on the game as you say in the financial sector and then monitoring the project then we'll unlock some strategic investments and strategic projects because if you ask me this is the only way in developing in developing Romania having big investment projects supported by the government together with the private sector which will crowd in money expertise and also the entire value chain around that project and also the externalities which will be generated by the project so we are working with a very small team at the ministry of finance on this we are i think only five five individuals on the team and together with my colleague from the cabinet with IFC, we have a couple of uh, projects on the table that we are looking at. Uh, EBRD also came to us with some projects. We, ha we have also asked uh, EIB to come to present us some projects. We are looking very much for projects which are uh, relevant for the communities, local communities, not very big projects, because I think another thing that I really learned is to work on projects which are under the radar of let's say uh, uh, mainstream media and sometimes also political uh, uh, debates like this you can focus quietly and professionally on those projects and show results and that those results should be on the media and on the political uh, uh, political arena on the financing indeed in Romania but not only in Romania in the whole Europe if you compare European Union with the US you'll see a huge gap in terms of uh, of opportunities for companies to finance right in uh, in europe and in romania uh, for the time being the companies uh, are developing their activities based on credit lines from the banking sector it's a reality as a reply to this uh, the government came with the the response of the fund of funds which were allocated 400 million euro for the for the uh, for financing management teams and private equity funds and venture capital funds which i think will be a game honestly a game changer for the sector i have to also confess because i have a specific experience in this i was previously a partner in a private equity fund before coming that uh, here and also before that i i used to work a couple of floors down uh, for eib from time to time because I was mainly located in Luxembourg. Uh, 
I really believe that it's a game changer. I, I started to work in Romania since 2019. I remember there were a couple of funds in the market. When I look now, uh, I see many private equity funds. Uh, they are also they were also registered due to the opportunities, business opportunities, companies which are there. Uh, uh, let's not forget that also the stock market in Romania is growing signific significantly and we are recovering, I would say, very fastly the gap with the uh, with the uh, Warsaw market, which is, I, I would say, ex exceptionally developed compared to the other uh, EU, Eastern EU countries, right? It's at the level of uh, Vienna uh, market in terms of uh, capitalization. So, so there is a capital market growing. There are funds which are uh, more and more funds present in the market. And then with this fund of funds where you have allocated 400 million euros, I think will be additional uh, additional private equity funds, which will allow the company to diversify their opportunity of financing. So there are a lot of things to be worked on. It's very exciting. It's very exciting to to be a Secretary of State at the Ministry of Finance, particularly in charge of uh, of investments and the state-owned companies. Um, I remain at uh, your disposal, and thank you very much, the World Bank, for all the cooperation that we have we had so far. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Secretary of State. Um, I want to open up a little bit the discussion uh, to, 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 to all of you. Uh, it's a conversation here. There's quite a lot put on the table. We looked at some of the longer term trends and how Romania can achieve its potential. In our assessment, there is probably good percentage and a half to be gained from reforms, and this is on an annual basis, which in cumulative terms can be absolutely uh, a game changer in uh, Romania's succession to uh, European uh, average incomes. Uh, but we are also, I think, all of us in agreement here in recognizing that today there are quite significant risks uh, that Romania, but also uh, Europe is facing. Uh, stemming from a lingering pandemic, which is not quite yet over, geopolitical risks, a war in Ukraine, a war just on the doorstep of Romania and of, of Europe, an energy crisis where energy security, but also energy diversification is one of the top priorities in, um, in, uh, in Europe, and uh, subsequently a quite um, quite rapidly growing inflation, as uh, as uh, as noted by by uh, Professor Dimitro. So, wanted to hear your reactions, questions, views that you might have to all of the panelists, but also to us at the World Bank. We have about fifteen minutes, or maybe a couple of questions could uh, could do it. One, one first, uh, Just a, a microphone because we have been streamed. Um, <clears throat> yes, one, one, uh, one question concerning uh, uh, the first half of the year. I mean, you, you, you talked about uh, all, the, uh, all the risks and uh, indeed, I mean, uh, the, the economic uh, situation, uh, the economic environment is very complicated, but um, <clears throat> the, the Romanian economy uh, performed very well on the first uh, uh, quarter and second quarter also. Uh, even economists uh, were surprised by this, uh, by this uh, very good performance. So my first question would be, what, what is the explanation actually? Uh, what drives the uh, economy up in Romania at the moment? And how do you see the second half of the year? Um, to introduce myself, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm uh, Pierre Lignot, uh, the head of the economic department at the French Embassy. Let's uh, maybe uh, collect a couple of more questions, one or two, and then uh, we can uh, again turn to our panelists and our team. Yes, please. Um, hello, I'm Radu Mushetesco, professor at Bucharest University of Economics. Uh, besides the regular report, which I appreciate a lot, World Bank published till recently the ease of doing business report. And uh, unfortunately for Romania in the last four to five years, 
the position uh, become worse and worse. That means from 35 five position to 55. So uh, I ask uh, if uh, the panelists can comment on the, uh, let's say, political and regulatory environment in Romania, which seems to be, especially during this crisis, um, going and using uh, very outmoded, <laughs> outmoded public policy. Thank you. Very good. So on the regulatory environment as a determinant of uh, productivity and business activity. Very good question. Um, any other questions? So maybe maybe we can start with uh, with those. Uh, Professor Dimitru, do you want to pick up um, on either one or yeah, both? And I'll uh, then turn uh, to, to, first, to our team. The first question of Pierre. So uh, honestly, we don't know. This is the, the answer. So why did the economy perform much better than expectations? We really don't know. I think nobody knows. Maybe you should call the, the National Institute of Statistics to explain why. <laughs> uh, yeah, but overall, the economy is performing better than expected. Uh, as we speak, Romania has a GDP per capita, which is higher than Greece. I was in Greece in the last days and uh, the difference is not clear. <laughs> so <laughs> basically you cannot see it. Uh, Romania has a GDP per capita which is higher than Slovakia, which I cannot believe it. Yeah, at PPP, of course, at PPS. Uh, so uh, basically Romania is not such a poor country anymore, looking at statistics. I think we have a problem and a big issue, I would say, with the quality of growth. You cannot say that the growth is sustainable when your current account deficit is more than 9% of GDP. So we need to address the structural issues we are having in the current account uh, uh, balance. So basically, the driver of the, the current account uh, imbalance is the energy sector, the chemical sector and the agri-food sector which is a shame, I would say, looking at our potential in agriculture. But we need to address the structural issues. And honestly, nobody cares, cares about that. So looking at our political spectrum, nobody is speaking about structural issues. So the biggest issue we are having now is to renegotiate PNRR instead of uh, doing something. Yeah, implementing reforms. I will stop here. Kathleen, do you want to comment on the uh, surprise in uh, performance yeah, in the first uh, half of the year? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, I, I want to say that historically speaking, Romania has had very high uh, growth rates. So, so if we look at the last 20 years, is one of the highest uh, real growth rates uh, uh, in Europe. So I think it's in the top four percent. So that means that the, the four, top four. That means that actually that's probably the, the the potential of the country. You know, if a country grows that fast for for that many years, that's probably that's where the potential. But at the same time, growth is very volatile. So if you look at uh, standard deviation, you see significant uh, variation from year to year, which is a sign that uh, more policy consistency it's uh, it's needed. Um, so again, um, I think there are discrepancies in growth. If you look at GDP dynamics versus uh, higher frequency, and maybe some components should be revisited, uh, like uh, the way we measure, for example, inventories. Uh, so uh, I think one should look also at the methodological framework, the current, uh, the, the national accounts uh, system to see uh, whether there are some potential, uh, potential errors uh, there. But uh, overall, I think one cannot deny that Romania has been a fantastic uh, achiever over the last uh, 20 years. So uh, we are where we are, I think, because of these high growth rates. At the same time, there are significant and probably growing regional differences. So if you look at Bucharest, Bucharest, I think it's a wealthy city. It's above the European average, right, in terms of uh, income so you can see that this prosperity and not only here not but also in other secondary uh, cities which have attracted a lot of investment including high 
high, high value added investments like ITC. But this coexists with uh, really other regions where, you know, conditions are very still very difficult, where uh, population is still living. So uh, there is a decline of population where the infrastructure, it is the way it is. And uh, clearly the quality of public service delivery doesn't meet uh, the, the standards of the, of the citizens. So a lot more needs to be done. And I think uh, these are pertinent questions that we really need to push forward with this kind of reform that we have seen in the in the PNRRA. I think all the ingredients are there, so we have to have the courage to do it, to implement it. And this is going to be a challenge, including because of the administrative capacity which the, which the Minister the Secretary of State was mentioning. So clearly we have a capacity issue uh, in the in the public sector and hopefully we will address it bit by bit. Thank you. Income differential, the regional income differential in Romania can be as large as four times between Bucharest and some of the poor uh, areas. Maybe State Secretary, you can comment a little bit on that? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, you really uh, uh, raised the ball on my field on, on with this. And I will also put it now on the World Bank because there is a very, very well report drif uh, drafted by World Bank, uh, Magnet Cities, it's called Migration Within Romania. So this is reflecting very well how Romania will look in the next 20, 50 years from now, right? Where the main activity will be, economic activity will be located in a couple of uh, big cities and everything will happen around that. And following this, uh, following this, also probably we'll see also some migration in this. So having this in mind, we already seeing it in Bucharest, in Timisoara, in Cluj, in Iași. Indeed, agree. We see it already. So having this in mind, I mean, if you're a, a leader, when you think investment policies, you should think in this logic, how to link the rural areas with these magnet cities, how you link in terms of infrastructure, either we speak road infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, water infrastructure, how you link the rural areas with these magnet cities. I mean, this would be a great leader, uh, leader. and I agree, instead of thinking uh, how to reshape uh, current projects, we should think long term uh, in long and big inf infrastructure projects. If you ask me the main reason for which uh, Romania is um, a European <laughs> a champion in terms of growth, and we are proud of that, is also because we are part of the European Union and part of the, we are in the process of convergence. And being uh, a smaller country in terms of economic di dimension, not in terms of uh, population or surface, but in terms of uh, economic dimension, we are trigger, I would say, faster to the average than other other countries. Uh, but again, the main challenge for this economic growth is that it's very much polarized around a couple of uh, big cities. And the responsibility, I think, for a government is to ensure uh, uh, a welfare, uh, in, uh, uh, equal welfare all over the countries or to address inequality and uh, and to promote investments not only in the big cities but to look also on the smaller regions or less uh, less privileged if you want uh, regions thank you very much very good and indeed uh, quality of growth is what we we heard uh, as a as a conclusion in some ways uh, is is uh, is missing while the quantity, if you will, may be uh, large. And we see this in uh, in the sources of growth uh, in, in Romania, primarily being driven by consumption, uh, which means that investment, as, uh, as uh, Anka pointed in her intervention, as, as Mihai pointed in uh, his uh, remarks, as well as Janusz uh, um, uh, also noted, uh, is uh, is an area where Romania can do significantly better, which links very nicely with the question which was posed uh, related to how do we attract investment here. The quality of regulatory environment uh, uh, is uh, is something which is very important. So I wanted to pass this to you, uh, Anka, and see if you can comment on that. So it, it is about quality uh, in terms of uh, quality of growth and also um, quality of uh, growth uh, for um, um, 
to close regional disparities, which are really uh, burdensome in, in Romania. And um, yeah, we, just to mention here, the famous uh, Penedele projects uh, we know for over 10 years, and we pushed for uh, more transparency in these projects and to really to be uh, sure that uh, uh, money are spent um, really efficiently and uh, we through these investments we really close the gaps and create uh, good infrastructure also uh, in the countryside or in the regions or poorer regions so they could attract investors and so on so but uh, regulatory I think uh, first of all it's about um, predictability this is a key word that in general is missing from the mindset of uh, policymakers. And this is not something happening uh, from yesterday, but uh, for many, many years. And uh, by the way, uh, I'm also worried that we continue to confuse uh, fiscal policies uh, with uh, collection policies. What we have to focus now is just on collection, just forget about the uh, uh, level of taxes, it, it's enough. Let's look at the quality of uh, um, uh, revenue agency, of the quality of the process. I do think, honestly, who is able to fill in by himself or herself uh, this uh, form of uh, Declaratia Unica, Declaratia, the, the, Declaratia Unica, the, the statement uh, to ANAF. Is anybody able to do it by himself or herself? Okay, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> That's it. Is it the one in the United Yeah, but they have a different system and it, it is a, a tradition that, I mean, it's so well known that you have deductibilities and so on, you hire somebody, uh, yeah. But okay, so regulatory, I, uh, it's about uh, an environment in general, and it's about predictability and sustainability. And uh, measures are, are changes overnight. We saw uh, increase in taxes uh, in July 28 for August 1st. And how is possible to have increase of taxes on labor from one day to another? with the excuse that actually it's closing some loopholes. Yes, but to close the loopholes as of next year. Breaching the fiscal uh, code. It's an article there in the fiscal code saying that it is implemented any increase of taxes as of the next year. So you uh, allow, com uh, allow companies uh, to adjust because they have some costs. They have a structure. They, it's, it's not like uh, we... Uh, uh, we can, uh, in the private sector, they cannot adjust overnight to whatever the, um, the officials, it's either government or parliament, are, are thinking. And um, if the question was about uh, the, the energy or... Oh, is of, yeah. One of the worst there, as I remember, uh, it's uh, the number of days in order to get uh, electricity. And I was shocked. I thought for some years that it's a mistake. But then I realized that it's not a mistake, that actually it's so... Uh, and the process is still uh, very difficult and there are many... Uh, I can testify. ...loopholes and... Uh, <laughs> it's very hard from inside. Uh, and let's, let's sit together and... Uh, I moved now. I also uh, I will be part of the energy uh, committee in the Senate. So I mean, this is something that you can close pretty easily. But that is not necessarily a public sector issue. It's a private sector one. Yeah, but it, you have the regulatory agency yeah. that should really go in in the right direction. Yeah. And uh, to make possible. Okay, uh, we don't have a few days to discuss, uh, so you don't get into that. Uh, yeah. So predictability and really uh, and this concept of uh, uh, evidence-based policy. You would be surprised how many uh, measures and ideas are flying around without any, any substantiation of uh, the topic and promoted by people that have no clue about what they are talking about. Is it working? Someone is hearing me? Yes. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> 
Uh, I used to work in on a daily basis, I would say, so far in two countries, in France and Luxembourg, and I used to be involved in projects across countries. In terms of easing, ease of doing business in Romania, I would be, let's say, more optimistic on this. I think Romania, compared to other European countries, is one of the I would say one of the best destinations in doing business and making investments in Romania. We should not forget that we are an emerging country, growing country. You have skilled people here in Romania with European background, which is more and more difficult to find in the labor market in the uh, in European Union. Uh, you have this fiscal uh, code. Okay, it's not perfect. Agree, we should rethink many parts or probably also radically think some some aspects from the fiscal code but still it's a business friendly code it remains with five percent on dividends where you can find this in european union uh 16 percent on uh, corporate tax what we are talking about it's <laughs> it's uh it's from the fiscal point of view it's one of the best uh, uh, <laughs> i wouldn't say that i didn't say that <laughs> i didn't say that but it's uh, one of the best place to do uh, business in Romania. Uh, okay, you have infrastructure, uh, telecom infrastructure, because it's not only about roads, but the main challenge in doing business is that the main, as I said from the beginning, the main businesses, when they come in Romania, they tend to be located in Bucharest, in Bucharest, mm -hmm. in uh, Cluj, in Timisoara. They are not looking for convergence regions. They are always looking on developed uh, cities. But as a general framework, Romania, from my perspective, remains one of the best destination in uh, European Union. I won't talk about the, also the fiscal exceptions that they have on some sectors because I might get enemies. Um, but let's not also forget about the state aid schemes that we have currently in place. We have for the relocation of businesses from Ukraine. Uh, um, uh, state aid scheme and we are now there is an ongoing state aid scheme for the local companies who wants to stimulate production and employ people here in Romania. Thank you very much. Very good. I think this is uh, a really um, important but also quite productive conversation uh, because what I hear is that uh, there is a level of ambition and a level of, uh, of desire of making Romania better. I mean, the country has converged quite rapidly uh, in the last two decades from something around 35% of uh, average European, European income uh, levels to over 70% uh, in just two decades. This is pretty remarkable indeed. But no one from what I heard here is declaring victory <laughs> because there is quite a lot to be done. The country has huge potential and only through reforms this potential can be uh, achieved. So I actually take away from this conversation quite a lot of energy and quite a lot of enthusiasm. And I see that there is uh, wonderful, very willing partners to take this country uh, forward. I'll turn to Anna to uh, lead us through the concluding part of this uh, very, very interesting conversation. Thank you very much, and really, I want to thank the uh, panelists that uh, shared um, their views in a very candid uh, way from the perspective of, of, of different institutions. And I also want to thank uh, Catalina and, and Emilia for, uh, for a very uh, rich presentation. Um, as a World Bank, we um, uh, keep sharing uh, our view of Romania as a tale of two Romanias. And I heard today a lot about this need for convergence of the two Romanias. One with magnet cities, with booming ICT sector, and with booming opportunities. We are in a city of uh, that, that that is one of the fastest growing cities in, in, in the European Union. And we have uh, people, we have uh, localities, we have uh, uh, certain uh, groups and firms that, 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 that are behind. And, and I think what we all uh, hope to, to do is how we can turn this tale of two Romanias into one fairy tale of Romania's development. And I heard that there is a roadmap to do that. We discussed today there are certain reforms that can lead us to that fairy tale. 
Uh, and yes, it may be a bumpy road. Some we, we, we all agree that road is not it's one, it's long road, but uh, at least we have the road, the, uh, and and we have the commitment and the interest to and in fact financing and resources to support uh, uh, the country to go on that, that road in the right direction. Some of the themes that uh, I also heard, how can we uh, lead on that road? Uh, one is uh, what uh, Ionuts was offering is we need to sequence certain things like what steps we do, it's important in which sequence we do that. Uh, we also heard from Anka that political will is extremely important, but then the trick is in implementation. And then I think what uh, uh, Mihai offered and, and, it, and question that he said is people, we need right people, we need people with right skills, uh, people that will uh, do their work while also creating a space for private initiatives, uh, a space for different sectors and for different uh, um, uh, sources of financing to, 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 to come forward. So. Uh, I leave this uh, conversation in a very optimistic uh, note because uh, there is a lot of work to be done, but I think there is a clear path to go there. Next week we will be launching, the World Bank will be launching uh, the consultations around the strategic uh, systematic country diagnostic. This again is a consultative uh, process that we want to go through to, together with all stakeholders to uh, agree on how we can sequence things, how we can create a roadmap for implementation. We count on your inputs. Please visit our website where we will have a platform for those consultations. And we will be going at the end of the month to different regions of Romania to hear from, from, uh, from different um, constituencies on how together we can create one fairy tale for Romania. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you.